Chapter 1. My Parents and Early Life The characteristic features of Indian culture have long been a search for ultimate verities and the concomitant disciple-guru relationship. My own path led me to a Christ-like sage whose beautiful life was chiseled for the ages. He was one of the great masters who are India's sole remaining wealth. Emerging in every generation, they have bulwarked their land against the fate of Babylon and Egypt. I find my earliest memories covering the anachronistic features of a previous incarnation. Clear recollections came to me of a distant life, a yogi amidst the Himalayan snows. These glimpses of the past by some dimensionless link also afforded me a glimpse of the future. The helpless humiliations of infancy are not banished from my mind. I was resentfully conscious of not being able to walk or express myself freely. Prayerful surges arose within me as I realized my bodily impotence. My strong emotional life took silent form as words in many languages. Among the inward confusion of tongues, my ear gradually accustomed itself to the circumambient Bengali syllables of my people the beguiling scope of an infant's mind, adultly considered limited to toys and toes. Psychological ferment in my unresponsive body brought me to many obstinate crying spells. I recall the general family bewilderment at my distress. Happier memories, too, crowd in on me. My mother's caresses, and my first attempts at lisping phrase and toddling step. These early triumphs, usually forgotten quickly, are yet a natural basis of self-confidence. My far-reaching memories are not unique. Many yogis are known to have retained their self-consciousness without interruption by the dramatic transition to and from life and death. If man be solely a body, its loss indeed places the final period to identity. But if prophets down through the millennians spake with truth, Man is essentially of incorporeal nature. A persistent core of human egoity is only temporarily allied with sense perception. Although odd, clear memories of infancy are not extremely rare. During travels in numerous lands, I have listened to early recollections from the lips of voracious men and women. I was born in the last decade of the 19th century and passed my first eight years at Gorakhpur. This was my birthplace in the United Provinces of Northeastern India. We were eight children, four boys and four girls. I, Mukunda Lal Ghosh, was the second son and the fourth child. Father and mother were Bengalis of the Kashtriya caste. Both were blessed with saintly nature. Their mutual love, tranquil and dignified, never expressed itself frivolously. A perfect parental harmony was the calm center for the revolving tumult of eight young lives. Father Bhagavati Charangosh was kind, grave, at times stern. Loving him dearly, we children yet observed a certain reverential distance. An outstanding mathematician and logician, he was guided principally by his intellect. But Mother was a queen of hearts and taught us only through love. After her death, Father displayed more of his inner tenderness. I noticed then that his gaze often metamorphosed into my mother's. In Mother's presence we tasted our earliest bittersweet acquaintance with the scriptures. Tales from Mahabharat and the Ramayana were resourcefully summoned to meet the exigencies of discipline. Instruction and chastisement went hand in hand. A daily gesture of respect to father was given by mother, dressing us carefully in the afternoons to welcome him home from the office. His position was similar to that of a vice president in the Bengal Nagpur Railway, one of India's large companies. His work involved traveling, and our family lived in several cities during my childhood. Mother held an open hand toward the needy. Father was also kindly disposed but his respect for law and order extended to the budget. One fortnight mother spent in feeding the poor, more than father's monthly income. All I ask, please, is to keep your charities within a reasonable limit. 
Even a gentle rebuke from her husband was grievous to mother. She ordered a hackney carriage, not hinting to the children at any disagreement. Goodbye, I'm going away to my mother's home. Ancient ultimatum. We broke into astounded lamentations. Our maternal uncle arrived opportunely. He whispered to father some sage counsel, garnered no doubt from the ages. After father had made a few conciliatory remarks, mother happily dismissed the cab. Thus ended the only trouble I ever noticed between my parents. But I recall a characteristic discussion. Please give me ten rupees for a hapless woman who has just arrived at the house. Mother's smile had its own persuasion. Why ten rupees? One is enough. Father added a justification. When my father and grandparents died suddenly, I had my first taste of poverty. My only breakfast before walking miles to my school was a small banana. Later at the university, I was in such need that I applied to a wealthy judge for aid of one rupee per month. He declined, remarking that even a rupee is important. How bitterly you recall the denial of that rupee. Mother's heart had an instant logic. Do you want this woman also to remember painfully your refusal of ten rupees, which she needs urgently? You went. With the immemorial gesture of vanquished husbands, he opened his wallet. Here is a ten rupee note. Give it to her with my good will. Father tended to say no to any new proposal. His attitude toward the strange woman who so readily enlisted mother's sympathy was an example of his customary caution. Aversion to instant acceptance typical of the French mind in the West is really only honoring the principle of due reflection. I always found father reasonable and evenly balanced in his judgments. If I could bolster up my numerous requests with one or two good arguments, he invariably put the coveted goal within my reach, whether it were a vacation trip or a new motorcycle. Father was a strict disciplinarian to his children in their early years, but his attitude toward himself was truly Spartan. He never visited the theater, for instance, but sought his recreation in various spiritual practices and in reading the Bhagavad Gita, shunning all luxuries he would cling to one old pair of shoes until they were useless. His sons bought automobiles after they came into popular use. But father was always content with the trolley car for his daily ride to the office. The accumulation of money for the sake of power was alien to his nature. Once, after organizing the Calcutta Urban Bank, he refused to benefit himself by holding any of its shares. He had simply wished to perform a civic duty in his spare time. Several years after father had retired on a pension, an English accountant arrived to examine the books of the Bengal Nagpur Railway Company. The amazed investigator discovered that father had never applied for overdue bonuses. He did the work of three men, the accountant told the company. He has rupees, 125,000, about $41,250, owing to him as back compensation. The officials presented father with a check for this amount. He thought so little about it that he overlooked any mention to the family. Much later, he was questioned by my youngest brother, Bijnu, who noticed the large deposit on a bank statement. Why be so elated by material profit? Father replied, The one who pursues a goal of even-mindedness is neither jubilant with gain nor depressed by loss. He knows that man arrives penniless in this world and departs without a single rupee. Early in their married life, my parents became disciples of a great master, the Hiri Mahasaya of Banares. This contact strengthened father's naturally ascetical temperament. Mother made a remarkable admission to my eldest sister, Roma. Your father and myself lived together as man and wife only once a year for the purpose of having children. Father first met Lahiri Mahasaya through Abhinash Babu, an employee in the Gorakhpur office of the Bengal Nagpur Railway. Abhinash instructed my young ears with engrossing tales of many Indian saints. He invariably concluded with a tribute to the superior glories of his own guru. Did you ever hear of the extraordinary circumstances under which your father became the disciple of Lahiri Mahasaya? 
It was on a lazy summer afternoon, as Abinash and I sat together in the compound of my home, that he put this intriguing question. I shook my head with a smile of anticipation. Years ago, before you were born, I asked my superior officer, your father, to give me a week's leave from my Gorakpur duties in order to visit my guru in Bananis. Your father ridiculed my plan. Are you going to become a religious fanatic? He inquired. Concentrate on your office work if you want to forge ahead. Sadly walking home along a woodland path that day, I met your father in a palanquin. He dismissed his servants in conveyance and fell into step beside me. Seeking to console me, he pointed out the advantages of striving for worldly success. But I heard him, listlessly. My heart was repeating, Lahiri Mahasaya, I cannot live without seeing you. Our path took us to the edge of a tranquil field where the rays of the late afternoon sun were still crowning the tall ripple of the wild grass. We paused in admiration. There in the field, only a few yards from us, the form of my great guru suddenly appeared. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. His voice was resonant in our astounded ears. He vanished as mysteriously as he had come. On my knees, I was exclaiming, Lahiri Mahasaya, Lahiri Mahasaya. Your father was motionless with stupefaction for a few moments. Nabinash, not only do I give you leave, but I give myself leave to start for Banaris tomorrow. I must know this great Lahiri Mahasaya, who is able to materialize himself at will in order to intercede for you. I will take my wife and ask this master to initiate us in his spiritual path. Will you guide us to him? Of course, joy filled me at the miraculous answer to my prayer and the quick favorable turn of events. The next evening, your parents and I entrained for Benares. We took a horse cart the following day and then had to walk through narrow lanes to my guru's secluded home. Entering his little parlor, we bowed before the master and locked in his habitual lotus posture. He blinked his piercing eyes and leveled them on your father. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. His words were the same as those he had used two days before in the Gorakhpur field. He added, I am glad that you have allowed Abhinash to visit me, and that you and your wife have accompanied him. To that joy he initiated your parents in the spiritual practice of Kriya Yoga. Your father and I, as brother disciples, had been close friends since the memorable day of the vision. Lahiri Mahasaya took a definite interest in your own birth. Your life shall surely be linked with his own. The master's blessing never fails. Lahiri Mahasaya left this world shortly after I had entered it. His picture in an ornate frame always graced our family altar and the various cities to which father was transferred by his office. Many a morning and evening found mother and me meditating before an improvised shrine, offering flowers dipped in fragrant sandalwood paste, with frankincense and myrrh, as well as our united devotions. We honored the divinity which had found full expression in Lahiri Mahasaya. His picture had a surpassing influence over my life. As I grew, the thought of the master grew with me. In meditation, I would often see his photographic image emerge from its small frame and taking a living form sit before me. When I attempted to touch the feet of his luminous body, it would change and again become the picture. As childhood slipped into boyhood, I found Lahiri Mahasaya transformed in my mind from a little image cribbed in a frame to a living and lightning presence. I frequently prayed to him in moments of trial or confusion, finding within me his solacing direction. At first I grieved because he was no longer physically living. As I began to discover his secret omnipresence, I lamented no more. He had often written to those of his disciples who were over-anxious to see him. Why well, come to view my bones and flesh when I am ever within the range of your kutashta? I was blessed about the age of eight with a wonderful healing through the photograph of Lahiri Mahasaya. This experience gave me intensification to love. While at our family estate in Ichapur, Bengal, I was stricken with Asiatic cholera. My life was despaired of. 
The doctors could do nothing. At my bedside, Mother frantically motioned me to look at Lahiri Mahasaya's picture on the wall above my head. Bow to him mentally. She knew I was too feeble even to lift my hands in salutation. If you really show your devotion and inwardly kneel before him, your life will be spared. I gazed at his photograph and saw there a blinding light, enveloping my body and the entire room. My nausea and other uncontrollable symptoms disappeared. I was well. At once I felt strong enough to bend over and touch Mother's feet in appreciation of her immeasurable faith in her guru. Mother pressed her head repeatedly against the little picture. O oh, omnipresent master, I thank thee that thy light hath healed my son. I realized that she too had witnessed the luminous blaze through which I had instantly recovered from a usually fatal disease. One of my most precious possessions is that same photograph, given to Father Balahiri Mahasai himself. It carries a holy vibration. The picture had a miraculous origin. I heard the story from my father's brother disciple, Kali Kumar Roy. It appears that the master had an aversion to being photographed. Over his protest, a group picture was once taken of him and a cluster of devotees, including Kali Kumar Roy. It was an amazed photographer who discovered that the plate which had clear images of all the disciples revealed nothing more than a blank space in the center where he had reasonably expected to find the outlines of Lahiri Mahasaya. The phenomenon was widely discussed. A certain student and expert photographer, Gangadhar Babu, boasted that the fugitive figure would not escape him. The next morning, as the guru sat in lotus posture on a wooden bench with the screen behind him, Gangadhar Babu arrived with his equipment. Taking every precaution for success, he greedily exposed twelve plates. On each one, he soon found the imprint of the wooden bench and the screen. But once again, the master's form was missing. With tears and shattered pride, Gangadhar Babu sought out his guru. It was many hours before Lahiri Mahasaya broke his silence with a pregnant comment. I am spirit. Can your camera reflect the omnipresent invisible? I see it cannot, but holy sir, I lovingly desire a picture of the bodily temple where alone to my narrow vision that spirit appears fully to dwell. Come then, tomorrow morning I will pose for you. Again the photographer focused his camera. This time the sacred figure, not cloaked with mysterious imperceptibility, was sharp on the plate. The master never posed for another picture. At least, I have seen none. The photograph is reproduced in this book. Lahiri Mahasaya's fair features of a universal caste hardly suggest to what race he belonged. His intense joy of God communion is slightly revealed in a somewhat enigmatic smile. His eyes, half open to denote a nominal direction on the outer world, are half closed also. Completely oblivious to the poor lures of the earth, he was fully awake at all times to the spiritual problems of seekers who approached for his bounty. Shortly after my healing through the potency of the guru's picture, I had an influential spiritual vision. Sitting on my bed one morning, I fell into a deep reverie. What is behind the darkness of closed eyes? This probing thought came powerfully into my mind. An immense flash of light at once manifested to my inward gaze. Divine shapes of saints sitting in meditation posture in mountain caves formed like miniature cinema pictures on the large screen of radiance within my forehead. Who are you? I spoke aloud. We are the Himalayan yogis. The celestial response is difficult to describe. My heart was thrilled. Ah, I long to go to the Himalayas and become like you. The vision vanished, but the silvery beams expanded into ever-widening circles to infinity. What is this wondrous glow? I am Ishwana. I am light. The voice was as murmuring clouds. I want to be one with thee. Out of the slow dwindling of my divine ecstasy, I salvaged a permanent legacy of inspiration to seek God. 
He is eternal, ever new joy. This memory persisted long after the day of rapture. Another early recollection is outstanding, and literally so, for I bear the scar to this day. My elder sister, Uma, and I were seated in the early morning under a neem tree in a Gorakhpur compound. She was helping me with a Bengali primer. What time I could spare my gaze from the nearby parrots eating ripe margosa fruit. Uma complained of a boil on her leg and fetched a jar of ointment. I smeared a bit of the salve on my forearm. Why do you use medicine on a healthy arm? Well, sis, I feel I'm going to have a boil tomorrow. I'm testing your ointment on the spot where the boil will appear. You are a liar. Sis, don't call me a liar until you see what happens in the morning. Indignation filled me. Uma was unimpressed and thrice repeated her taunt. An adamant resolution sounded in my voice as I made slow reply. By the power of will in me, I say that tomorrow I shall have a fairly large boil in this exact place on my arm, and your boil shall swell to twice its present size. Morning found me with a stalwart boil on the indicated spot. The dimensions of Uma's boil had doubled. With a shriek, my sister rushed to mother. Mukunda has become a necromancer. Gravely, mother instructed me never to use the power of words for doing harm. I have always remembered her counsel and followed it. My boil was surgically treated. A noticeable scar left by the doctor's incision is present today. On my right forearm is a constant reminder of the power in man's sheer word. Those simple and apparently harmless phrases to Uma, spoken with deep concentration, had possessed sufficient hidden force to explode like bombs and produce definite though injurious effects. I understood later that the explosive vibratory power in speech could be wisely directed to free one's life from difficulties and thus operate without scar or rebuke. Our family moved to Lahore in the Punjab. There I acquired a picture of the Divine Mother in the form of the goddess Kali. It sanctified a small, informal shrine on the balcony of our home. An unequivocal conviction came over me that fulfillment would crown any of my prayers uttered in that sacred spot. Standing there with Uma one day, I watched two kites flying over the roofs of the buildings on the opposite side of the very narrow lane. Why are you so quiet? Uma pushed me playfully. I am just thinking how wonderful it is that Divine Mother gives me whatever I ask. I suppose she would give you those two kites. My sister laughed derisively. Why not? I began silent prayers for their possession. Matches are played in India with kites whose strings are covered with glue and ground glass. Each player attempts to sever the string of his opponent. A freed kite sails over the roofs. There is great fun in catching it. Inasmuch as Uma and I were on the balcony, it seemed impossible that any loosed kite could come into our hands. Its string would naturally dangle over the roofs. The players across the lane began their match. One string was cut. Immediately the kite floated in my direction. It was stationary for a moment through sudden abatement of breeze which sufficed to firmly entangle the string with the cactus plant on top of the opposite house. A perfect loop was formed for my seizure. I handed the prize to Uma. There was just an extraordinary accident and not an answer to your prayer. If the other kite comes to you, then I shall believe. Sister's dark eyes conveyed more amazement than her words. I continued my prayers with a crescendo intensity. A forcible tug by the other player resulted in the abrupt loss of his kite. It headed toward me, dancing in the wind. My helpful assistant, the cactus plant, again secured the kite string in the necessary loop by which I could grasp it. I presented my second trophy to Uma. Indeed, Divine Mother listens to you. This is all too uncanny for me. Sister bolted away like a frightened fawn. Chapter 2 my mother's death and the mystic amulet. My mother's greatest desire 
was the marriage of my elder brother. Ah, when I behold the face of Ananta's wife, I shall find heaven on this earth. I frequently heard Mother express in these words her strong Indian sentiment for family continuity. I was about eleven years old at the time of Ananta's betrothal. Mother was in Calcutta, joyously supervising the wedding preparations. Father and I alone remained at our home in Bareilly in northern India, whence father had been transferred after two years at Lahore. I had previously witnessed the splendor of nuptial rites for my two eldest sisters, Roma and Uma, but for Ananta, as the eldest son, plans were truly elaborate. Mother was welcoming numerous relatives, daily arriving in Calcutta from distant homes. She lodged them comfortably in a large, newly acquired house at 50 Amherst Street. Everything was in readiness, the banquet, delicacies, the gay throne on which brother was to be carried to the home of the bride-to-be, the rows of colorful lights, the mammoth cardboard elephants and camels, the English, Scottish, and Indian orchestras, the professional entertainers, the priests for the ancient rituals. My father and I in gala spirits were planning to join the family in time for the ceremony. Shortly before the great day, however, I had an ominous vision. I was in Barelli on a midnight. As I slept beside father on the piazza of our bungalow, I was awakened by a peculiar flutter of the mosquito netting over the bed. The flimsy curtains parted, and I saw the beloved form of my mother. Awaken your father. Her voice was only a whisper. Take the first available train at four o'clock this morning. Rush to Calcutta if you would see me. The wraith-like figure vanished. Father, mother is dying. The terror in my tone aroused him instantly. I sobbed out the fatal tidings. Never mind that hallucination of yours. My father gave his characteristic negation to a new situation. Your mother is in excellent health. If we get any bad news, we shall leave tomorrow. You shall never forgive yourself for not starting now. Anguish caused me to add bitterly, nor shall I ever forgive you. The melancholy morning came with explicit words. Mother, dangerously ill. Marriage postponed. Come at once. Father and I left distractedly. One of my uncles met us en route at a transfer point. A train thundered toward us, looming with telescopic increase. From my inner tumult an abrupt determination arose to hurl myself on the railroad tracks. Already bereft, I felt, of my mother. I could not endure a world suddenly barren to the bone. I loved mother as my dearest friend on earth. Her solacing black eyes had been my surest refuge in the trifling tragedies of childhood. Does she yet live? I stopped for one last question to my uncle. Of course she is alive. He was not slow to interpret the desperation in my face, but I scarcely believed him. When we reached our Calcutta home, it was only to confront the stunning mystery of death. I collapsed into an almost lifeless state. Years passed before any reconciliation entered my heart. Storming the very gates of heaven, my cries at last summoned the Divine Mother. Her words brought final healing to my suppurating wounds. It is I who have watched over thee, life after life, in the tenderness of many mothers. See in my gaze the two black eyes, the lost beautiful eyes, thou seekest. Father and I returned to Bareilly, soon after the crematory rites for the well-beloved. Early every morning, I made a pathetic memorial pilgrimage to a large shaoli tree, which shaded the smooth green-gold lawn before our bungalow. In poetical moments, I thought that the white shaoli flowers were strewing themselves with a willing devotion over the grassy altar. Mingling tears with the dew, I often observed a strange otherworldly light emerging from the dawn. Intense pangs of longing for God assailed me. I felt powerfully drawn to the Himalayas. 
one of my cousins, fresh from a period of travel in the holy hills, visited us at Bareli. I listened eagerly to his tales about the high mountain abode of yogis and swamis. Let us run away to the Himalayas. My suggestion one day to Dwarka Prasad, the young son of our landlord in Bareli, fell on unsympathetic ears. He revealed my plan to my elder brother, who had just arrived to see father. Instead of laughing lightly over this impractical scheme of a small boy, Ananta made it a definite point to ridicule me. Where is your orange robe? You can't be a swami without that. But I was inexplicably thrilled by his words. They brought a clear picture of myself roaming about India as a monk. Perhaps they awakened memories of a past life. In any case, I began to see with what natural ease I would wear the garb of that anciently founded monastic order. Chatting one morning with Dwarka, I felt the love for God descending with avalanchic force. My companion was only partly attentive to the ensuing eloquence, but I was wholeheartedly listening to myself. I fled that afternoon toward Nenital in the Himalayan foothills. Ananta gave determined chase. I was forced to return sadly to Bareli. The only pilgrimage permitted me was the customary one at dawn to the Sheoli tree. My heart wept for the lost mothers, human and divine. The rent left in the family fabric by mother's death was irreparable. Father never remarried during his nearly forty remaining years. Assuming the difficult role of father-mother to his little flock, he grew noticeably more tender, more approachable. With calmness and insight, he solved the various family problems. After office hours, he retired like a hermit to the cell of his room, practicing Kriya Yoga in a sweet serenity. Long after mother's death, I attempted to engage an English nurse to attend to details that would make my parents' life more comfortable. But father shook his head. Service to me ended with your mother. His eyes were remote with a lifelong devotion. I will not accept ministrations from any other woman. Fourteen months after mother's passing, I learned that she had left me a momentous message. Ananta was present at her deathbed and had recorded her words. Although she had asked that the disclosure be made to me in one year, my brother delayed. He was soon to leave Bareli for Calcutta to marry the girl mother had chosen for him. One evening, he summoned me to his side. Mukunda, I have been reluctant to give you strange tidings. Ananta's tone held the note of resignation. My fear was to inflame your desire to leave home. But in any case, you are bristling with divine ardor. When I captured you recently on your way to the Himalayas, I came to a definite resolve. I must not further postpone the fulfillment of my solemn promise. My brother handed me a small box and delivered mother's message. Let these words be my final blessing, my beloved son Mukunda, mother had said. The hour is here when I must relate a number of phenomenal events following your birth. I first knew your destined path when you were but a babe in my arms. I carried you then to the home of my guru in Benares. Almost hidden behind a throng of disciples, I could barely see Lahiri Mahasaya as he sat in deep meditation. While I patted you, I was praying that the great guru take notice and bestow a blessing. As my silent devotional demand grew in intensity, he opened his eyes and beckoned me to approach. The others made a way for me. I bowed at his sacred feet. My master seated you on his lap, placing his hand on your forehead by way of spiritually baptizing you. Little mother, thy son will be a yogi. As a spiritual engine, he will carry many souls to God's kingdom. My heart leaped with joy to find my secret prayer granted by the omniscient Guru. Shortly before your birth, he had told me you would follow his path. Later, my son, your vision of the great light was known to me and your sister Roma, 
as from the next room we observed you motionless on the bed. Your little face was illuminated. Your voice rang with iron resolve as you spoke of going to the Himalayas in the quest of the divine. In these ways, dear son, I came to know that your road lies far from worldly ambitions. The most singular event in my life brought further confirmation, an event which now impels my deathbed message. It was an interview with the sage in the Punjab. While our family was living in Lahore, one morning the servant came precipitately into my room. Mistress, a strange sadhu is here. He insists that he see the mother of Mukunda. These simple words struck a profound chord within me. I went at once to greet the visitor, bowing at his feet. I sensed that before me was a true man of God. Mother, he said, the great masters wish you to know that your stay on earth will not be long. Your next illness shall prove to be your last. There was a silence, during which I felt no alarm, but only a vibration of great peace. Finally he addressed me again. You are to be the custodian of a certain silver amulet. I will not give it to you today. To demonstrate the truth in my words, the talisman shall materialize in your hands tomorrow as you meditate. On your deathbed, you must instruct your eldest son, Ananta, to keep the amulet for one year and then to hand it over to your second son. Mukunda will understand the meaning of the talisman from the Great Ones. He should receive it about the time he is ready to renounce all worldly hopes and start his vital search for God. When he has retained the amulet for some years and when it has served its purpose, it shall vanish, even if kept in the most secret spot. It shall return whence it came. I proffered alms to the saint and bowed before him in great reverence. Not taking the offering, he departed with a blessing. The next evening, as I sat with folded hands in meditation, a silver amulet materialized between my palms, even as the sadhu had promised. It made itself known by a cold, smooth touch. I have jealously guarded it for more than two years, and now leave it in Ananta's keeping. Do not grieve for me as I shall have been ushered by my great guru into the arms of the infinite. Farewell, my child. The Cosmic Mother will protect you. A blaze of illumination came over me with possession of the amulet. Many dormant memories awakened. The talisman, round and anciently quaint, was covered with Sanskrit characters. I understood that it came from teachers of past lives who were invisibly guiding my steps. A further significance there was indeed, but one does not reveal fully the heart of an amulet. How the talisman finally vanished amidst deeply unhappy circumstances of my life, and how its loss was a herald of my gain of a guru, cannot be told in this chapter. But the small boy thwarted in his attempts to reach the Himalayas, Daily traveled far on the wings of his amulet. Chapter 3 The Saint with Two Bodies Father, if I promise to return home without coercion, may I take a sightseeing trip to Benares? My keen love of travel was seldom hindered by father. He permitted me, even as a mere boy, to visit many cities and pilgrimage spots. Usually one or more of my friends accompanied me. We would travel comfortably on first-class passes provided by father. His position as a railroad official was fully satisfactory to the nomads in the family. Father promised to give my request due consideration. The next day he summoned me and held out a round-trip pass from Bareilly to Benares, a number of rupee notes and two letters. I have a business matter to propose to Benari's friend, Gedarnat Babu. Unfortunately, I have lost his address, but I believe you will be able to get this letter to him through our common friend, Swami Paranabhananda. The Swami, my brother disciple, has attained an exalted spiritual stature. You will benefit by his company. This second note will serve as your introduction. 
My father's eyes twinkled as he added, Mine, no more flights from home. I set forth with the zest of my twelve years, though time had never dimmed my delight in new scenes and strange faces. Reaching Benares, I proceeded immediately to the Swami's residence. The front door was open. I made my way to a long, hall-like room on the second floor. A rather stout man wearing only a loincloth was seated in lotus posture on a slightly raised platform. His head and unwrinkled face were clean-shaven. A beatific smile played about his lips. To dispel my thought that I had intruded, he greeted me as an old friend. Baba Anand, bliss to my dear one. His welcome was given heartily in a childlike voice. I knelt and touched his feet. Are you the Swami Pranabhananda? He nodded. Are you Bhagavati's son? His words were out before I had time to get father's letter from my pocket. In astonishment, I handed him the note of introduction, which now seemed superfluous. Of course, I will locate Kedarnath Babu for you. The saint again surprised me by his clairvoyance. He glanced at the letter and made a few affectionate references to my parent. You know I am enjoying two pensions. One is by the recommendation of your father, for whom I once worked in the railroad office. The other is by the recommendation of my heavenly father, for whom I have conscientiously finished my earthly duties in life. I found this remark very obscure. What kind of pension, sir, do you receive from the Heavenly Father? Does he drop money in your lap? He laughed. I mean a pension of fathomless peace, a reward for many years of deep meditation. I never crave for money now. My few material needs are amply provided for. Later, you will understand the significance of a second pension. Abruptly terminating our conversation, the saint became gravely motionless. A sphinx-like air enveloped him. At first his eyes sparkled, as if observing something of interest, then grew dull. I felt abashed at his posiloquy. He had not yet told me how I could meet father's friend. A trifle restless, I looked about me in the bare room, empty except for us two. My idle gaze took in his wooden sandals lying under the platform seat. Little sir, don't get worried. The man you wish to see will be with you in half an hour. The yogi was reading my mind, a feat not too difficult at the moment. Again, he fell into inscrutable silence. My watch informed me that thirty minutes had elapsed. The Swami aroused himself. I think Kedarnath Babu is nearing the door. I heard somebody coming up the stairs. An amazed incomprehension arose suddenly. My thoughts raced in confusion. How is it possible that Father's friend has been summoned to this place without the help of a messenger? The Swami has spoken to no one but myself since my arrival. Abruptly I quitted the room and descended the steps. Halfway down I met a thin, fair-skinned man of medium height. He appeared to be in a hurry. Are you Kedar, not Babu? Excitement colored my voice. Yes, are you not Bhagavati's son who has been waiting here to meet me? He smiled in friendly fashion. Sir, how do you happen to come here? I felt baffled resentment over his inexplicable presence. Everything is mysterious today. Less than an hour ago I had just finished my bath in the Ganges when Swami Pranabhananda approached me. I have no idea how he knew I was there at that time. Bhagavati's son is waiting for you in my apartment, he said. Will you come with me? I gladly agreed. As we proceeded, hand in hand, the Swami in his wooden sandals was strangely able to outpace me, though I wore these stout walking shoes. How long will it take you to reach my place? Pranabhanandaji suddenly halted to ask me this question. About half an hour. I have something else to do at present. He gave me an enigmatical glance. I must leave you behind. You can join me in my house, or Bhagavati's son and I will be waiting for you. Before I could remonstrate, he dashed swiftly past me and disappeared in the crowd. 
I walked here as fast as possible. This explanation only increased my bewilderment. I inquired how long he had known the Swami. We met a few times last year, but not recently. I was very glad to see him again today at the bathing ghat. I cannot believe my ears. I am losing my mind. Did you meet him in a vision, or did you actually see him, touch his hand, and hear the sound of his feet? I don't know what you're driving at, he flushed angrily. I'm not lying to you. Can't you understand that only through the Swami could I have known you were waiting at this place for me? Why, that man, Swami Paranabhananda, has not left my sight a moment since I first came about an hour ago. I blurted out the whole story. His eyes opened widely. Are we living in this material age, or are we dreaming? I never expected to witness such a miracle in my life. I thought this Swami was just an ordinary man, and now I find he can materialize an extra body and work through it. Together, we entered the saint's room. Look, those are the very sandals he was wearing at the ghat. Kedarnath Babu whispered. He was clad only in a loincloth, just as I see him now. As the visitor bowed before him, the saint turned to me with a quizzical smile. Why are you stupefied at all this? The subtle unity of the phenomenal world is not hidden from true yogis. I instantly see and converse with my disciples in distant Calcutta. They can similarly transcend at will every obstacle of gross matter. It was probably in an effort to stir spiritual ardor in my young breast that the Swami had condescended to tell me of his powers of astral radio and television. But instead of enthusiasm, I experienced only an awe-stricken fear. Inasmuch as I was destined to undertake my divine search through one particular Guru Sri Yukteswar, whom I had not yet met, I felt no inclination to accept Pramabhananda as my teacher. I glanced at him, doubtfully, wondering if it were he or his counterpart before me. The master sought to banish my disquietude by bestowing a soul-awakening gaze and by some inspiring words about his guru. Lahiri Mahasaya was the greatest yogi I ever knew. He was divinity itself, in the form of flesh. If a disciple, I reflected, could materialize an extra fleshly form at will, what miracles indeed could be barred to his master? I will tell you how priceless is a guru's help. I used to meditate with another disciple for eight hours every night. We had to work at the railroad office during the day. Finding difficulty in carrying out my clerical duties, I desired to devote my whole time to God. For eight years, I persevered, meditating half the night. I had wonderful results. Tremendous spiritual perceptions illumined my mind but a little veil always remained between me and the infinite. Even with superhuman earnestness, I found the final irrevocable union to be denied me. One evening I paid a visit to Lahiri Mahasaya and pleaded for his divine intercession. My importunities continued during the entire night. Angelic Guru, my spiritual anguish is such that I can no longer bear my life without meeting the great beloved face to face. What can I do? You must meditate profoundly. I am appealing to thee, O God, my master. I see thee, materialized before me, in a physical body. Bless me that I may perceive thee in thine infinite form. Lahiri Mahasaya extended his hand in a benign gesture. You may go now and meditate. I have interceded for you with Brahma. Immeasurably uplifted, I returned to my home. In meditation that night, the burning goal of my life was achieved. Now, I ceaselessly enjoy the spiritual pension. Never from that day has the blissful Creator remained hidden from my eyes behind any screen of delusion. Pramabhananda's face was suffused with divine light. The peace of another world entered my heart. All fear had fled. The saint made a further confidence. Some months later, 
I returned to Lahiri Masaya and tried to thank him for his bestowal of the infinite gift. Then I mentioned another matter. Divine Guru, I can no longer work in the office. Please release me. Brahma keeps me continuously intoxicated. Apply for a pension from your company. What reason shall I give so early in my service? Say what you feel. The next day, I made my application. The doctor inquired the grounds for my premature request. At work, I find an overpowering sensation rising in my spine. It permeates my whole body, unfitting me for the performance of my duties. Without further questioning, the physician recommended me highly for a pension, which I soon received. I know the divine will of Lahiri Mahasaya worked through the doctor and the railroad officials, including your father. Automatically, they obeyed the great Guru's spiritual direction and freed me for a life of unbroken communion with the Beloved. After this extraordinary revelation, Swami Pranabhananda retired into one of his long silences. As I was taking leave, touching his feet reverently, he gave me his blessing. Your life belongs to the path of renunciation and yoga. I shall see you again with your father later on. The years brought fulfillment to both these predictions. Kedarnath Babu walked by my side in the gathering darkness. I delivered father's letter which my companion read under a street lamp. Your father suggests that I take a position in the Calcutta office of his railroad company. How pleasant to look forward to at least one of the pensions that Swami Pranabhananda enjoys. But it is impossible. I cannot leave Benares. Alas, two bodies are not yet for me.